This is Brother Peter Diamond of MostHolyFamilyMonastery.com. There is proof for purgatory in the Bible. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 15. Let's examine this biblical proof for purgatory. No matter how hard non-Catholics who deny the existence of purgatory might try to explain it away, this verse cannot be explained away. I will quote the 1611 King James Version of the Bible, a famous Protestant translation. 1 Corinthians 3, 12-15, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire." End quote. Now let's look at the last part of this passage again. In 1 Corinthians 3.15, we see that it says, quote, If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. End quote. So we have a man whose works have been judged. His works are in fact burned, and he suffers loss, yet he is saved but by fire. He suffers loss, but is saved by fire. What does this suffer loss mean? Well, the Greek word which is translated as suffer loss is a form of the Greek word zemeo. Forms of this same Greek word zemeo, which is translated as suffer loss in 1 Corinthians 3.15, are found in other passages of the Bible. In Exodus 21.22, Proverbs 17.26, Proverbs 19.19, 19, and elsewhere, this very Greek word zemeo is used to mean punishment. That means that zemeo, the very word translated as suffer loss in 1 Corinthians 3.15, can mean punishment. Therefore, the man who suffers loss and is saved by fire in 1 Corinthians 3.15 can mean a man who is punished and is saved by fire. Doesn't that sound just like purgatory? Yes, it sounds exactly like purgatory, because that's what it's referring to. But there is more from the context to demonstrate the point. Who is this man, and why is he suffering loss or punishment and being saved by fire? The context of 1 Corinthians chapter 3 deals with members of the Church of Christ. It deals with Corinthian Christian believers. In 1 Corinthians 3.3, we see that some of these Corinthian Christians were falling into sinful imperfections and offenses against God. Some of these bad works or sins are described in 1 Corinthians 3.3 as strife, divisions, and envying. So the context of 1 Corinthians 3 deals with the different kinds of works of believers. Some of them are not so good. These different kinds of works are described in 1 Corinthians 3.12. There are good works, which are called gold, silver, and precious stones. These signify a better or more perfect adherence to the gospel of Christ. Then there are other works which are not so good. These are described as wood, hay, and stubble. These are the works that are in fact burned in 1 Corinthians 3.15 for which the man suffers loss or punishment, but he is saved, yet so as by fire. So the wood, hay, and stubble, which are burned, signify the works of a man who has died in the grace of God and been forgiven of any mortal sins he might have committed, and he is therefore eventually saved, but he hasn't made satisfaction for the sins that he did commit. The dogmatic counsel of Leon II in 1274 Put it this way, quote, Because if they die truly repentant in charity before they have made satisfaction by worthy fruits of penance for sins committed and omitted, 
their souls are cleansed after death for purgatorial or purifying punishments. End quote. A great example of a man who has been forgiven of his mortal sin, but hasn't made satisfaction for it, is found in the case of David. In 2 Kings 11, or 2 Samuel 11 in the Protestant Bible, we read about King David committing adultery with Bathsheba. He also had Bathsheba's husband killed. This is a mortal sin. If David would have died in that state, he would have gone to hell. 1 Corinthians 6.9 shows us that no adulterers or murderers will enter heaven. But David repented of his sin when convicted of it by Nathan in 2 Samuel 12. 2 Samuel 12.13 or 2 Kings 12.13 quote, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin. Thou shalt not die. End quote. The Lord took away David's sin, and Nathan said that he would not die, meaning he would not eternally die. The sin was forgiven because David truly repented and turned from it. But was that the end of it? No. Full satisfaction for this mortal sin which he had committed and been forgiven for had not yet been made. We read in 2 Samuel 12, 14-15, that David had to undergo the loss of his child to make satisfaction for his sin, a sin which had already been forgiven. Second Samuel twelve fourteen to 15 quote, Because by this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And Nathan departed unto his house. And the Lord struck the child that Uriah's wife bare unto David, and it was very sick. End quote. This kind of satisfaction for the remaining punishments due to forgiven mortal sins is often done on earth by good works and prayers and by a more perfect adherence to the true faith. If such satisfaction is not done on earth, it is and must be done in purgatory, assuming that the person dies in the grace of God. The satisfaction must be done because the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse, makes it clear that nothing impure shall enter heaven. Apocalypse 21:27, quote, There shall not enter into it anything defiled, end quote. Now it must be emphasized that purgatory is not for those who die in mortal sin or outside the true faith. It is only for those who die in the state of grace, which is also known as the state of justification. It is for those who die in grace but haven't satisfied for the temporal punishment due to their forgiven mortal or venial sins. Mortal sins destroy the state of justification. That's why 1 John 5.16 distinguishes between sins which lead to death and sins which don't. 1 John 5.16, quote, If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask and he shall give him life for them, that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. End quote. So we see a distinction between sins unto death and sins not unto death. Venial sins, that is, lesser offenses against God, weaken the soul and make it more vulnerable to mortal sin. Mortal sins destroy the state of grace and put one in a state of damnation, so that if one dies in a state of mortal sin, he will be damned. Examples of mortal sins are fornication, murder, drunkenness, lying, cheating, stealing, fraud, theft, masturbation, looking at pornography, giving full consent to impure thoughts, homosexuality, heresy, idolatry, violating the commandments, etc., that's why 1 Corinthians 3.17, just after the verse which proves purgatory, 1 Corinthians 3.15, says this, quote, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are, End quote. This verse is referring to those who die in mortal sin, those who die unjustified. They will be lost. Mortal sin after baptism can be forgiven only by confession to a valid priest, as proven from John 20:23. 20, Baptism, the initial grace of spiritual rebirth, the rebirth of water and the Holy Ghost spoken of in John chapter 3, verse 5, forgives all original, mortal, and venial sin, 
as well as the temporal punishment due to sin, so that if one dies after baptism, assuming he has the full Christian faith, the Catholic faith, he will go straight to heaven. But mortal sin after baptism can be forgiven only by confession to a valid priest, as proven from John 20:23. 20, it could also be forgiven by perfect contrition with the desire to go to confession. 1 Corinthians 3.17 serves to prove that the context of 1 Corinthians 3 is dealing with sins. That's very important because it establishes that the lesser sins or the satisfactions or imperfections which are left over for some and burned up in 1 Corinthians 3.15 are indeed punishments for sins in purgatory. Other indirect proofs for purgatory are found in other parts of the New Testament. For example, in Matthew 5, Matthew 5, 25 to 26, quote, Agree with thy adversary quickly, while thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out thence, till thou hast paid the uttermost farthing, end quote. We see that Jesus tells the parable of the man who, for his faults, is cast into prison until he pays up or satisfies for his debt. This is exactly like purgatory. In Matthew 12.32 we read this, quote, And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. End quote. Why would Jesus say that the sin against the Holy Ghost will not be forgiven in this world or in the world to come? A father of the church, such as Pope St. Gregory the Great, understood these words of Jesus to imply that certain sins will be forgiven or made up for in the next world, such as in purgatory. It should also be noted that we see that God uses fire, 1 Peter 1, 7, and discipline to reform and purge his children. John 15:2 quote, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth, that it may bring forth more fruit. End quote. Jesus disciplines his children to make them more perfect and bear more fruit. If this is not done unto satisfaction on earth, it must be done in purgatory. In addition to all of this biblical proof, Purgatory is proven by the fact that the fathers of the Christian church clearly believed in and taught purgatory and prayers for the dead. The fathers of the church are the Christian writers from the earliest centuries. They are those who received the tradition of the apostles. St. Augustine is a famous father of the church. Augustine is generally regarded with honor by Catholics and by non-Catholics who claim to be Christian. Yet, St. Augustine clearly believed in purgatory and prayers for the dead. St. Augustine of Hippo, Sermons 4.11, quote, There is no doubt that the dead are aided, that the Lord might deal more mercifully with them than their sins would deserve. The whole church observes this practice which was handed down by the fathers, that it prays for those who have died in the communion of the body and blood of Christ, end quote. Notice that St. Augustine says that the whole Christian church prays for the faithful departed, those who died in proper communion with the true church. St. Augustine, Faith, Hope, and Love, 421, quote, That there should be some such fire even after this life is not incredible, and it can be inquired and either be discovered or left hidden, whether some of the faithful may be saved, some more slowly and some more quickly in the greater and lesser degree, in which they loved the good things that perish through a certain purgatorial fire. St. Augustine, Faith, Hope, and Love, 421, quote, Nor can it be denied that the souls of the dead find relief through the piety of their friends and relatives who are still alive when the sacrifice of the mediator is offered for them, or when alms are given in the church. End quote. Many other fathers could be quoted to prove praying for the dead and thus purgatory, but here are just a few others. St. Gregory of Nyssa, Sermon on the Dead, 383, quote, A man finds that he is not able to partake of divinity until he has been purged of the filthy contagion in his soul by the purifying fire, end quote. 
Tertullian, Monogamy, after 213 A.D., quote, A woman, after the death of her husband, she prays for his soul and asks that he may, while waiting, find rest, and that he may share in the first resurrection. And each year, on the anniversary of his death, she offers the sacrifice, end quote. This proves that even in the 3rd century, the practice of the church was to pray for the faithful departed, those who died in the true church and apparently free from the state of mortal sin. St. Cyril of Jerusalem, Catechetical Lectures, 350 A.D. Quote, then we make mention also of those who have already fallen asleep, for we believe that it will be of very great benefit to the souls of those for whom the petition is carried up. End quote. St. John Chrysostom, Homilies on 1 Corinthians 392, quote, Let us help and commemorate them. If Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them, end quote. So we can see that purgatory was clearly taught in Scripture and was believed by the earliest Christians. It should be emphasized that prayers can only be properly offered for those who have died in communion with the true church and apparently free from the state of mortal sin. But why did the ancient Christians believe in purgatory and prayers for the dead? It's obviously not because this was a man-made doctrine, but because they clearly saw that it was taught in the Bible and was part of the tradition received from the apostles. Some might argue that Christ's suffering on the cross redeemed us and made up for everything, so that no one would have to go through something such as purgatory. But this argument is false. Colossians 1.24, quote, I now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up those things that are wanting of the sufferings of Christ in my flesh for his body, which is the church, end quote. This verse might be a shock to some non-Catholics who are not familiar with it. St. Paul says in Colossians 1.24 that he fills up for the church those things that are wanting or lacking in the sufferings of Christ. Now, the suffering of Christ was perfect and of infinite value. So what does this mean? What St. Paul means in this verse is that many sufferings are still wanting and needed for the members of the church to work out their salvation, which was made possible by Christ's sacrifice. So this verse should clearly show any person that Christ's sacrifice doesn't do away with all worries about the possibility of future punishment due to one's sins. If so, then Paul would never say that his sufferings fill up for members of the church that which is wanting in the sacrifice of Christ. Nor would Jesus speak of the punishments for sins, which he repeatedly did. Colossians 1.24 also proves the Catholic doctrine of the communion of the saints and the effect of intercessory prayer and sacrifice. There is no doubt that Jesus Christ's death redeemed the world. As the Catholic Council of Florence declared, Jesus Christ, quote, through his death alone, laid low the enemy of the human race by destroying our sins and opened the entrance to the kingdom of heaven, which the first man, Adam, by his own sin had lost. End quote. By his death, Jesus Christ ransomed us back and gave everyone who followed him and obeyed his true faith the opportunity to be saved. He opened the gates of heaven and destroyed all sins, past, present, and future, by giving everyone the chance to be readmitted to friendship with God, by following him and doing what he says must be done. But that does not mean that the penalty of all the sins of the whole world has been taken away. If that were true, then no one would even have to believe or do anything for salvation, for Jesus already did it all. Everyone would be saved and no one would go to hell. And this is clearly false, of course. But there is another clear proof for purgatory. It comes from the second book of Maccabees. Some non-Catholics might immediately think, that book is not in my Bible. It's true that the books of the Maccabees are not in the Protestant Bible. They are not in the Protestant Bible because Martin Luther, the first Protestant, removed them when he split from the Catholic Church in the 16th century. He also added the word alone to Romans 3.28, 
and criticized other books which were left in the Protestant Bible, such as the book of James. In all, the Protestant Bible is missing seven books from the Old Testament, books which were removed because they contain things which Catholicism teaches and Protestantism rejects. Even though these books were part of the canon or collection of scripture from the ancient church onwards, the Protestant Bible doesn't have them. But the fact that the books which the Protestants reject, such as the books of the Maccabees, are truly part of scripture and should be included in any true Bible, can be proven by the Bible itself. For example, there is something called the Septuagint. The Septuagint was the famous Greek translation of the Old Testament, which was made by 70 scholars a few centuries before the birth of Jesus Christ. You can read a lot about the Septuagint on the internet. This famous translation of the Old Testament from Hebrew into Greek contains the seven books of the Old Testament which the Protestant Bible rejects. Now here's the interesting part. There are about 350 quotations from the Old Testament in the New Testament which has come down to us. Well, about 300 of those quotations are from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. In other words, the New Testament which even Protestants have quotes the version of the Old Testament which accepts the Catholic books of the Bible. This shows us that the New Testament writers themselves accepted the Septuagint and therefore the seven books of the Old Testament which the Protestants reject. But there's more. In Hebrews 11.35 of the Protestant and Catholic Bible, we see reference to an event which is only recorded in the second book of Maccabees, chapter 7. Hebrews 11.35, quote, Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection, end quote. This reference in Hebrews 11.35 is found in only one place in the Bible. It's not found in the Protestant Bible. It's found in 2 Maccabees 7 of the Catholic Bible, which tells the story of the mother and her seven sons. This mother and her seven sons refused deliverance from torture so that they might receive resurrection with the just. Their story is what's described in Hebrews 11.35. This proves that 2 Maccabees, which the Protestant Bible does not have, is without question part of the true Old Testament, and 2 Maccabees chapter 12 clearly teaches prayer for the dead and therefore purgatory. 2 Maccabees 12.46, It is therefore a holy and wholesome thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from their sins. End quote. This verse could hardly be more clear. It says that it's a holy thought to pray for the dead, that they may be loosed from sins. That means that there is a place after death where some of the faithful who will be saved are detained, where they can be aided by prayer. That place is purgatory, and this verse clearly proves it. That's why it was removed from the Bible by those who wanted to invent a new version of Christianity which is not conformable to Catholic tradition or the teaching of the Bible. We must now come to the conclusion of this audio program. In this tape we've seen irrefutable evidence that purgatory is taught in the Bible. It's taught in 1 Corinthians 3.15, which speaks of a man being saved through fire while he is suffering loss or punishment. We've seen that the occasional need to satisfy for the remaining temporal punishment due to sin, even after that sin has been forgiven, is clearly taught in the Bible, as in the case of David having been forgiven but still having to suffer temporal punishment, the loss of his child, to fully satisfy for his mortal sin. We've seen that Apocalypse 21:27 teaches that nothing impure will enter heaven, so that purification for the remaining temporal punishments due to forgiven sins must be done through good works on earth or through suffering in purgatory. We've seen that Jesus alludes to a place like purgatory in Matthew 5.26. We've seen that Matthew 12.32 implies that sins can be forgiven in the world to come. We've seen that 1 Peter 1.7 and John 15.2 speak of God using purging and fiery discipline to conform souls to him. 
we've seen that the early Christians, the fathers of the church, believed in purgatory. We even quoted someone like St. Augustine, who is regarded with honor by even most non-Catholics who are familiar with the early church. The testimonies of these early church fathers prove that purgatory has been the teaching of Christianity from the beginning. It was also the practice and belief of the Jews of the Old Testament, a practice which even modern Jews who rejected the gospel did retain as part of their tradition. Finally, we quoted the clear proof for prayers for the dead in 2 Maccabees 12.46. This book teaches purgatory, and this book is proven to be part of sacred scripture by Hebrews 11.35. The Catholic Church teaches purgatory. This is because the Catholic Church is the one true church of Jesus Christ, which is faithful to all of his teachings and all biblical truth. One must belong to this one true church, the Catholic Church, for salvation.